everybody. Wasn't that amazing? Thanks very much, Madda. So I'm pretty familiar with the next company. They're one of my favorites. Uh, and they're here to talk about the global ecosystem and expanding beyond the valley. So they've experienced growth like I've never seen, from expanding across the US and London to a $2.5 billion partnership with Cisco. And all eyes are really on their new user-centric security platform, Jewish Security. However, Jewish Security HQ remains outside Silicon Valley, which is quite interesting. So in a conversation with Peter Himmler, explaining his choice to see the world as one collective ecosystem is the founder of Jewish Security, Doug Song. Welcome, guys. Hello. Okay, great audience. Um, before we start, I want to know who everyone is in this room. So how many people are from America, from the United States? Good, few. Ooh. How many from Europe? <laughs> Asia, South America, Latin America, and the UK. All right. You didn't get that joke. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> um, if you're tweeting, Doug Song, D-U-G-S-O-N-G, Peter Himmler, H-I-M-L-E-R, those are our Twitter handles. Um, we want to talk a little bit about whether it's necessary to be in a tech city to grow and scale your company. And so Doug, Doug's company um, is an extraordinary success story. They're based out of Ann Arbor, Michigan. And um, as you know, Ann Arbor is the home of the University of Michigan. And I guess my first question, Doug, is, I mean, do you, if you're going to build a company, don't you need the talent at a major university, maybe even with an engineering program? It definitely helps. Um, so, so again, we, we are from Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is the home of the university. Uh, the city of Ann Arbor is only about 100,000 people, um, and actually all of them fit in our football stadium. We have the, also the, the largest uh, football stadium in North America. Right. But really what you know, the story of Ann Arbor is about is the larger story of, of Detroit and the fact that there is an ecosystem around us. We don't have to be in the city right, to benefit from that. We can be in Ann Arbor where, again, we have lots and lots of you know, uh, new graduates, but the fact that there is an established industry around us from Detroit is easy, it makes it easy for us to grow and scale from. And uh, just so you know, Doug and I had a chance to talk uh, back in the States about a week ago, and you told me there were certain elements that needed to be in place in order for you to feel like the company could grow. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what are the ingredients for a startup to look for in the city in which they hope to set, set their headquarters? Well, I like to think that there's something strategic about any location that you can draw upon. And what I encourage people to think about, particularly those that are not in the valley, we were a company that started in Michigan, and we made the decision to stay in Michigan even when all of our funding came from California. And some of our earliest uh, potential investors used to try to convince us, you know, you have to be in Silicon Valley to be a successful and scalable you know, tech company. I think the reality is that you know, for companies like ours, um, and when we started the company, we were you know, myself and my co-founder was an academic, you know, PhD student. Um, we didn't have a lot of seasoned serial uh, startup executives that we could draw upon. And so we did have to reach out a little bit. Right. And as I said, we don't have to be in Silicon Valley, but we needed a little bit of Silicon Valley in us. And so we reached through our networks to find folks that had any kind of connection back to Michigan that we could draw upon. And so I, did ab I was able to hire folks like uh, Jim Sib, my head of sales in the Valley, but I was also able to relocate folks like Zach Erlocker, who was, became our COO from California, who, and he, where he had done companies like MySQL, Zendesk, and move him back to Michigan. And so when we think about the talent strategy, right, in building those kind of teams, you have to look at it globally, as much as you draw upon what's local um, you know, to your area. Um, I would think that given the interest in security and data privacy, et cetera, maybe you rode the wave a little bit uh, in terms of your success. I mean, you were at the right time at the right place or yeah. the right time and uh, apparently the right place. Yeah, I think half of success is just being, uh, is, is being lucky. And truly the problem that we chose to solve ended up becoming the biggest geo geopolitical problem of our time. Um, we are a cybersecurity company and we help organizations protect themselves against breaches. Uh, in this digital age, and you know, in an era when even governments can't keep their secrets, truly nobody is safe. And we, just being on the on the leading edge of that uh, that that sea change, right? Of of, of uh, not only the threats and the risks escalating, 
it has been a tremendous opportunity again for our, our company. And you want to take a second and just explain to this audience what multi-factor auth authorization is and, and just a little bit about your technology, why it has been so successful for the enterprise. Yeah, I, I, we've all seen the consumerization of IT change our relationship to how we use devices, applications, um, but it's been true for, organiz for organizations as well. Enterprise you know, CISOs or CIOs no longer have control over how people actually use IT when I can choose to use, uh, say, Dropbox instead of using the corporate file server and so forth. And so the big change for us has been to make security something that every organization could have their users successfully adopt by making it easy. And that's really, I think, the, uh, uh, you know, the innovation that we brought to, the, to an industry that for a long time had been very, very painful for folks to deal with. So give me some metrics. So the company was founded in what year, how many, how many employees, yeah. how many users today? Yeah, so Duo started in 2010. So we're about eight years old. And we started, uh, well today, as of today, we've grown from that to over 700 employees. Uh, we were acquired by Cisco for uh, over two Instagrams. Um, and so it, it has been a very interesting journey for us. Um, but we service 12,000 organizations around the world. 10, over you know, tens of millions of users now, and um, have operated at global scale, even from the middle, right, of the US. And, and you have a footprint, so you're, you're headquartered in Ann Arbor, but you ha you're in Silicon Valley, you're also in Austin, did you Austin, tell me? Texas. And then where overseas? Uh, London, London's headquarters, right. uh, for European headquarters. Yep. So I, I think a lot of people will also be interested that, that have startups that are, that are succeeding, Hopefully everyone in this room has a startup that's succeeding, but you sold to Cisco, uh, what, six, in the last six months? Uh, for $2.35 billion. So what was the decision? You know, why, why did you sell to Cisco? Right. Well, we weren't looking to be acquired. Um, and in fact, I think that's what helped uh, lead us to kind of uh, you know, a transaction, an outcome like that, that, uh, that has been very um, beneficial for them and for us. We've taken the long view in how to build a company uh, that can leave a legacy uh, for ourselves, but also build a future right, for our customers with. And you know, when Cisco came at us, um, there were three considerations we really had around what, whether it made sense or not. You know, the first, for any of you who have investors, it's always going to be a basic one. Is it sort of the right valuation? Now, you know, that's something you, you do have to think about when you think about the valuation trajectory of your company, how fast you know, things are growing and how much opportunity is being created by your success so you don't ride it over the top, right? There, there are many examples of, of companies that uh, missed opportunities along the way to find sort of the, the right outcome for, them, for themselves um, when otherwise they, um, they, they could have gotten stuck. The second though is really about the culture that if you spend all this time and effort building an amazing organization, wonderful team, wonderful culture, it's like raising a child, right? Having a baby, you're not gonna have some uh, you know, crazy psychopath adopt that child. So culture is sort of a second bar that I think is, is, is a basic one, right, to really fulfill. But it's the third one I think is actually the most important, which is the strategic alignment. And it turned out that much of what Cisco had intended to do in the, age, in the era of access and, and, and security, right, in the cloud, aligned to our Ford roadmap. And so they'd already acquired some other companies and built some properties there. They had a line vision of what they were trying to do that actually was ours, right? Why we started Duo and what we we're trying to do, democratizing security, right? As much as you know, Cisco as a company had connected users, devices, applications everywhere, building networks and building these bridges, right, to possibility, I think we have had similar ambition to make sure that was all, could all be made safe. And so it made a, a lot of sense uh, strategically for us to pursue that um, journey together. But truth be told, it wasn't something we were looking for. And because of that, I think that's where, um, again, it was a, you know, um, a tr truly a notable sort of deal in, in our industry um, because we weren't otherwise for sale. And I, I would encourage you as you think in the journey of, of your businesses to take that long view of what you're trying to do. Um, Jessica Lesson, anyone know who that is? She writes a, uh, a subscription publication called The Information. It's really insightful. She used to be at the Wall Street Journal. Her husband was one of the early, early people at Facebook. And she wrote a piece recently, or The Information wrote a piece called To Snare Tax Break, Venture Firms Eye Relocating Startups. So there's this movement in the states where they have these cities that are given special tax consideration. Is that a reason for a startup to, to listen to their venture capital, their VCs, and, and move to one of those? 
I think it's the opposite, actually. I think it's the opportunity for venture capital to find its way to other cities and locations where typically, you know, a lot of VC investors will make choices about uh, their investments based on the geographic radius, that they don't want to go very far, right, to go take a board meeting and so forth, um, which I think is a little bit lazy thinking, right? You know, opportunity, I think, is, uh, you know, I, I think talent is actually equally distributed around the world. There's smart people everywhere, hardworking people everywhere, but opportunity is not. And things like those kind of tax breaks that you're seeing, um, I think in the US, it was actually mostly the work of uh, the former president of Facebook, um, Sean Parker, who started uh, what's now called these opportunity zones and a tax credit around uh, capital gains taxes um, that are kind of forgiven or at least deferred if the investments are done in one of several cities in the US uh, that are targeted for economic development. So cities like Baltimore, cities like Detroit, where we are, um, benefit from that. And I think that is the alignment that we as a community in tech need to be thinking about more, more broadly. It's not just what we do, but how we do it and where we do it. I mean, one of the things you mentioned to me that Cisco allowed you to do was to scale, to give you that global footprint. And you, and you also said the culture was right. So it's been four months or six months. How, how long month. have you been there? <laughs> how long have you been officially part of Cisco? Yeah, we've been officially part of Cisco for one month. Oh, for one month? One month. So how's it going? Well, <laughs> it's, yeah, going it's, well. it's early yet, but we're figuring it out. Yeah, and it's what you expected, because I keep, yeah. keep thinking about Facebook and what the founders of Instagram and WhatsApp now think about Facebook, and they were not happy. I guess there wasn't a good cultural fit there. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so the founder of, of, of WhatsApp is an old, an old friend of mine, Jan Kuhn, from a hacking group I was part of called WooWoo, this international uh, team of folks working on security research. And I think, you know, WhatsApp and, 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 and you know, Facebook have a really interesting alignment from the start. But again, you know, there, we live in an age where, where tech as an industry is having to reconcile the adverse effects or the unintended consequences, right? Sometimes of its own business models, where you saw Tim Cook on stage talking about how you know, companies need, to, need not to, it wasn't their data they were holding and monetizing, it's their users' data. And in Europe, I think people understand this very well. I think in the US, we're still you know, coming to terms with what our moral responsibility is around how we treat you know, data um, that, our, that our customers and users provide us um, and that we are truly guardians of. But I think um, you know, we will see probably more things like that uh, as tech evolves and figures out what it should be doing. And I was glad to learn that the Duo Security brand name is going to live on as a division of Cisco. Are, are you going to market, are you going to continue to support the brand and market it as that brand? Or are you going to leverage Cisco? Or how do you reconcile the two in terms of your, you know, your public face? And, and, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think we have much to figure out. But I think a few things are true. You know, Cisco is a much bigger company than us. You know, we're 700 people. They're 700,000, or 70,000. We have 12,000 customers. They have 800,000. But we have been called the most loved company in security. You know, the one metric that's been most important to me as we've guided this business has been not our top line revenue, not our capital efficiency and, you know, uh, profitability, al although we've done, we've been best in class on both of those, both on top line and on our bottom line, but it's actually been NPS, net promoter score, and a measure, a formal measure of customer satisfaction and how happy our end users and our customers are with our products and, and their experience with us. And that user, uh, experience that we've been able to give organizations is something that is going to be new for Cisco. Typically, they've been the infrastructure, they've been the network. You don't really see or know that you're using Cisco network. You're going to know if you're using Cisco security via Duo because we're right there, the front door, right, of, of all your access to applications. I'm sure there are a lot of founders here that have been walking around the Web Summit and seeing other technologies that are kind of like their own, you know? Um, how do you differentiate Duo from others? I mean, granted, yes, you're in the enterprise, mm -hmm. and I just saw Gary Kasparov speak, and he's involved with a, a security company that does stuff for the home. So who are your competitors, or, and, and how do you ensure that you are seen in a in a distinguished, differentiated light. Yeah, security is a tough market this way. And many, many of you might be in industries that are similarly old, established, mature, and also crowded. You know, our industry actually has 1,200 other vendors. And think wow. about that. As, as, as a customer, if you're trying to figure out what you should do, you've got over 1,000 vendors that you could be doing it with. Um, and all the messaging same, sounds the same. And a lot of it is sold on fear. So it's, 
It's a lot of sensationalistic kind of uh, scary stuff. Um, I think the way that we have chosen to differentiate ourselves in building a better company is again, it's not just in building better technology, not just building a better user experience, but thinking about how we innovate on all levels. And so while we are an enterprise company, we sell to some of the world's largest and fastest growing organizations, we also sell to some of the smallest. And we have a free edition of our product even that's you know, free in perpetuity for very small customers. And that's another way in which we have differentiated. We've believe, we believe that to democratize security, to create the largest possible, to solve the largest possible problem right, in, in the market, we would have to solve for it by innovating not just on our products, but also on our go-to-market. And so when you look at how Duo sells, how we market, all of that is highly differentiated because you can try before you buy. You have all the documentation. There's no salespeople you have to talk to to even buy the product. Um, we're kind of like Atlassian that way. Atlassian's a very good customer of ours, and they, they do an amazing job of building a velocity model of business. And for us, that's been the other true measure of what not our customer product satisfaction is, but um, what the buying motion and the, the go-to-market looks like. The velocity of, of time to value. How fast can we deliver what customers are looking for you know, to them, not, not just the technology, but as an, as, a, as an organization and operationally. And so when you think about where and how you disrupt, I think you know, it's more than just the technology. And I think there's tremendous opportunity when you, when you look at um, when you look at it from the customer's perspective, all the hoops that they have to jump through right, to, uh, to, be, to be successful using a technology or a product uh, and can solve for all of it holistically, that's where I think um, you know, magic happens. Because you know, for instance, Apple. Apple was not the first company to invent the MP3 player or the phone or the computer or the watch. But what did they do? They, they thought about it as a design problem. And that's how we've thought about it as well. What, what kind of design thinking can we apply to a very old and crowded industry that can cut through all this noise? Because you know, if you look at like an Apple go-to-market motion, I mean, they, they, they did things that no other computer retailer did. They created the, all the Apple stores. You know, it's like this amazing experience. You walk through these you know, glass doors, and it's all white. It's like you're walking to this church of Apple. You've got like the geniuses at the genius right, bar, right. these high priests. You know? <laughs> it's like this religious experience. The box has magnets. You know, they figured out how to create a completely different experience for their customers and one that would engender trust over the long term. Where if you're an Apple customer, you're typically not buying one product, you're buying like everything, right? Right, the whole ecosystem. So, um, so I guess the, 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 the essence of this talk is a little bit about location. Yeah. And can you survive outside of Silicon Valley? First of all, a lot of people in the United States think Silicon Valley is broken. Uh, you know, I mean, there's some, they have some real issues, in the, the municipality, you know, et cetera. I mean, San Francisco does. So if, in your travels, are there certain cities that you have been especially enamored with? I mean, I know Stockholm, for example, has a great, <laughs> you know, yeah. maker culture, founder culture. So, you know, I, I think there's something, every city is about something. Right? I mean, New York is about money, and uh, DC is about power. Right? In the US, it, a lot of that power just shifted as of the last, last 24 hours. Um, in LA, Hollywood is about fame. But San Francisco is about disruption, which, as you know, is sometimes about disrupting things that maybe shouldn't be. There's a social contract, right? Um, and you know, places like, you know, I just came from London yesterday, where, where we have our ME headquarters. And uh, you know, London, I really truly think, is the crossroads right, of the globe. Right? And, um, and I think, uh, you know, one of the things that we've been able to draw upon from where we sit in Detroit and in Ann Arbor is uh, a very different culture. And when you think about what is strategic to a business, why are organizations more successful than others? It's culture, how they operate, how they treat each other, how they treat their customers. And I think when you, th when you as founders think about how and where you scale your businesses, don't forget that because I think culture is king. It drives so many of the decisions you make about how and where you set up. It drives decisions about um, the kind of talent and the bar and, and, and the trade-offs and choices that you will make. For instance, one of the ones that we make at Duo is that we don't trade off character for competence. And in the Valley, I think you've seen quite a lot of that, right? Where you see folks that are very skilled at what they do, they're amazing executives, but then there's all this dirty laundry for us, we have always said, you know, we demand both character and competence. And having that sort of moral standard for us is just part of what being in Michigan is about, you know? Um, 
So some of you may have heard that there was an election last night in the United States. And, um, you know, a lot of us that are in the tech space or in communications, we're, we're sort of looking at the climate and there are many, you know, financial institutions are very happy about the current administration. But it seems to me that the immigration policy has hurt a lot of tech companies, especially with regard to foreigners coming in. Are you finding that? Is, is America now less conducive for, for the startup culture than, let's say, Justin Trudeau's Canada, or you know, well, I, I can't speak to what, what all may transpire. I mean, all, you know, there's, 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 I think what's, what's, what we can all recognize is that the world is in a great, in a great amount of change happening, a lot of structural change, and I think those things bring with them certain risks. They also sometimes bring with them certain opportunities. I think we don't know how it all land or what it will all mean, but what I'd say is that these are things that, as as founders, in a place that we understand that we, when we participate in our communities, we help to drive and align our success, the success of what's around us, we can leverage all the resources and all that is strategic about location to our advantage. And so my, my strong suggestion here is that, again, as we see all the things that, that will change, people in tech always think, oh, I gotta figure out what's gonna change and, and stay ahead of that. Actually, a large part of being successful, I think, in building a, a, a business for customers over the long haul is figuring out what won't change as Jeff Bezos says. If there are fundamental truths to your business, to your, your organization, to your culture, and to, to your location, identifying that, capitalizing that on that, and really optimizing your success based on that, I really think is a true formula for scalable growth. Um, you've obviously been following, as have all of us, Amazon's decision to open a second headquarters. And I think we're, we got maybe 30 seconds, so the last question. So, What's your prediction? <laughs> so they've announced three cities that are likely, you know, Arlington, Virginia, New York City, Long Island City, and Queens, and then, um, was it Texas or no, uh, uh, Dallas, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you want to go on the, put your, you know, go on. I, I, I don't know what that'll be, but what, what I can say is that a lot of cities have given a lot of data to, to Amazon at this point about themselves. And I'm sure that they're not going to sit on it. They'll figure right. out again how to, how to best optimize their business based on, information about a lot of these places that nobody else knows at this point. So well, we'll one byproduct, I hope if it's New York and Washington, they fix the Acela, the train that goes between the two cities. So there we go. Okay. So thank you very much. Really thank nice you, job. Peter. Yeah. Thank all of you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right. Nice job. Thank you.